<laughs> okay. All right. Well, well, welcome everyone. I'm Beth Sullivarger. I'm president of Women's City Club, and I'm pleased to introduce Women's City Club's first online public program ever. It's nice to see so many members and future members. Founded in 1915, Women's City Club has as its mission to educate, engage, and empower citizens on civic issues in the greater Cincinnati community, and we would love to have you as a member. Today, we celebrate the centennial of the day. The 19th Amendment went into effect with a program on voting rights then and now. We will hear from two excellent speakers, Dr. Catherine Durek, a former Miami University professor on the critical yet forgotten role Ohio played in the fight for women's suffrage, including the role of women's clubs, which sprang up in the early 20th century. Addressing current barriers to voting rights today will be Catherine Terser, Executive Director of Common Cause Ohio, a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy. Common Cause works to create open, honest, and accountable government that serves the public interest to promote equal rights, opportunity, and representation for all, and to empower all people to make their voices heard in the political process. Each speaker will be followed by a Q&A session managed by Jeff Dye, our VP for Programs and Technical Wizard, who is producing this program. Sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about Catherine. Great. Um, very interesting person. Um, she's a former English professor. Um, and she is an authority on women's suffrage. She created a series of podcasts entitled The Genius of Liberty, The Long Struggle for Women's Equality for the Mercantile Library, and co-curated an exhibit at the Downtown Public Library this past spring. She also serves as Ohio's representative on the National Board for the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial Association, and is a member of the 2020 Women's Vote Centennial Initiative Task Force. I give you Catherine Durup. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Yeah. I'm going to so, uh, share screen here because I've got pictures to share. And let's see. It's All right. Well, um, here we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment on the very day it was adopted into law a century ago. Now, millions, literally millions of women fought for suffrage, yet this movement uh, and its heroes have largely been forgotten. So think of this. Of those millions of suffragists, can you name five? This evening, I'm going to be introducing you to a number of these women, including members of Women's City Club of Cincinnati. And I'm gonna tell, as Beth said, a little bit about the crucial yet forgotten role that Ohio played in the fight for women's suffrage. Now, the story of women's suffrage began at a time when the Ohio River bustled with steamboats and Cincinnati was the first stop uh, to freedom for fugitive slaves. And in fact, the centennial story is incomplete if we fail to acknowledge that the 19th Amendment was only a partial victory, as it would be another 45 years before women of color were empowered to join their sister Americans at the polls. The story of woman suffrage in Ohio reflects this complicated past. It is a story of courage, persistence, and clout. In 1848, the same year that this image of Cincinnati's riverfront was captured, while white women in Seneca Falls, New York, modeled their statement of freedom on the Declaration of Independence, freed women in Cincinnati used washboards and shovels to fend off slave catchers harassing blacks in the city. Courage. It seems especially fitting to begin with the story of a group of Ohio students whose protest a decade before Seneca Falls had a lasting effect on abolition and women's rights. 
1834, students at Lane Seminary in Walnut Hills held a series of fiery debates on slavery over 18 days. When the school was threatened by an angry mob, the Board of Trustees decided to abolish the Student Anti-Slavery Society and dozens of students and one of the trustees, Asa Mahan, walked out. Now, many of them ended up at Oberlin College. Mahan was offered the presidency and he required that black students be admitted, making Oberlin the first college in the country to admit both women and men, black and white. Generations of leaders have been educated at Oberlin, including Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown, classmates, abolitionists, and women's rights activists, and uh, sisters-in-law when they married Cincinnati's Blackwell brothers. Anna J. Cooper and Mary Church Terrell were also, were also classmates as well as activists and educators. Now, not everyone from Lane Seminary ended up at Oberlin. Theodore Dwight Weld went on a speaking tour for which he is credited with abolitionizing Ohio. Now, eventually, Theodore recruited two Southern women to the American Anti-Slavery Society, sisters Sarah and Angelina Grimke. The sisters soon discovered that in order to argue against slavery, they first had to argue for a woman's right to speak in public. Angelina appealed directly to Northern women. We do not and cannot concede that because slavery is a political subject, women ought to fold their hands in idleness and close their eyes and ears to the horrible things that are practiced in our land. Sarah was just as direct. Men and women were created equal. They are both moral and accountable beings and whatever is right for man to do is right for woman. In 1850, the Anti-Slavery Bugle published this meeting announcement inviting citizens to meet in Salem, Ohio, to prepare a statement to be submitted to the Ohio Constitutional Convention. Organizers advocated equal rights regardless of sex or color. The main outcome of this meeting was a statement that requested equal voting, political, and legal rights for women, but that's not all. It was the first public meeting to be organized and run entirely by women. Men were allowed to uh, sit in, but they were not allowed to speak or to vote. For the first time in the world's history, men learned how it felt to sit in silence when great questions were pending. Never did men so suffer. Nevertheless, at the close, the men organized and endorsed all that the women had said and done. One of those men in the meeting was a young John Allen Campbell who left the convention quite impressed with the women and the proceedings. Years later, after he became the first territorial governor of Wyoming, John Campbell signed a new voting rights bill into law, and Wyoming became the very first place in the United States to offer equal voting rights for women and men. Now, the official proceedings of the next Ohio Women's Rights Convention omitted the words of a black woman who took the floor. Fortunately, the Anti-Slavery Bugle published an account of the speech for which the entire convention later became famous. I am a woman's rights. I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and can eat as much too, if I can get it. The more widely known version of this speech was provided by Frances Dana Gage in an account published more than a decade after Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? Now, this is The Genius of Liberty, one of the very first feminist newspapers in the United States, published in Cincinnati by Elizabeth Aldrich. In the issues shown here, Aldrich proclaims 18 causes to preserve and protect our democracy. Among these causes are free public schools, admission of women to any trade or profession, equal pay for equal work, and a woman's right to vote. Now, prior to the Civil War, Ohio hosted two national women's rights conventions. And Fran Frances Dana Gage uh, presided over the Cleveland Convention and, in 1853, and a woman's rights newcomer, Susan B. Anthony, uh, served on the P Finance Committee. 
The press ridiculed Cincinnati's 1855 convention, calling the organizers the vote and wear men's clothes women, and they noted that those who attended included women in bloomers and men in shawls. One of the convention leaders was Martha Coffin Wright, sister of Quaker activist Lucretia Mott and a cousin of Levi Coffin of the Underground Railroad. The opening speaker in Cincinnati was this woman, Ernestine Rose, one of the best known and admired orators of the day, a Polish immigrant and a rabbi's atheist daughter. Rose was considered by Susan B. Anthony as the bravest and most fearless of women. While lecturing in the South, Rose received a thinly veiled threat from a slaveholder who remarked that as an abolitionist, she would have been tarred and feathered uh, had she not been a woman. Rose retorted, you are so exceedingly lazy and inactive here because, of course, the slaves did all the work. Were it even to give me a coat of tar and feathers, it would be an act of charity to give you something to do. Now, Rose is shown here in this photograph posed in imitation of Francis Wright. Like Ernestine Rose, Francis Wright was an immigrant, an abolitionist, and a champion of American democracy and social equality. Most significantly, Francis Wright was the very first female public orator in the United States, and she launched her speaking career in Cincinnati's Hamilton County Courthouse in 1828. Both Wright and Rose uh, championed education, equal education, because in Wright's words, women hold the destinies of humankind. And uh, you can still make out these words on her marker, her monument in Spring Grove Cemetery. That's our photograph here. I have wedded the cause of human improvement, staked on it my fortune, my reputation, and my life. Persistence. When we think of suffragists like Susan B. Anthony, we tend to think of them like this, as old woman. The very persistence of the suffragists became a reason for ridiculing them. The newspapers taunted Miss Anthony, who they claimed after nearly 30 years of campaigning for women's rights hadn't been kissed and had developed corns on her tongue. We forget that when they began the fight, many of the early leaders of the woman suffrage movement were young women in their 20s and 30s, and few of them would actually even live long enough to see victory, and the fight would be actually won by later generations of suffragists. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucy Stone both married and bore daughters who carried on the fight. Here are the uh, and so here we see them with their children, and here are young suffragists as adults, Harriet Stanton Blatch and Alice Stone Blackwell. Now, activists who started out in Ohio uh, dedicated their lives to the cause as well, working coast to coast and cradle to grave. So um, let me introduce you to Caroline Severance, an abolitionist and women's rights activist. Born in New York, Caroline began her activism in Northeast Ohio. So in the 1850s, she's actually one of the leaders of Ohio's a women's rights movement. In 1855, Caroline leaves Ohio and she goes to Boston, where she continues her activism. And in the 1870s, Severance moves to California, where she becomes a leader of the West Coast women's suffrage movement. I mentioned Mary Church Terrell earlier. Uh, she had deep connections to Ohio. In the 1870s, Mary, the daughter of freed slaves, is sent as a little girl to Yellow Springs to begin her education. In 1884, she becomes one of the very first African-American women to graduate from Oberlin. And in 1909, she becomes a charter member of the NAACP. In 1913, Terrell insisted that Black women be permitted to march in the historic uh, suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. And in 1950, having witnessed the deterioration of Black civil rights over her lifetime, when she is in her 80s, Mary Church Terrell started what would become a successful fight to integrate eating places in the District of Columbia with tactics, think of this, at 80 years old, and she's involved with boycotts, picketing, and sit-ins. Daughter of Isaac M. Wise, the founder of Reform Judaism, Helen Wise Maloney was a leader in Ohio's suffrage movement. Now, I think Helen was probably influenced by her father. 
By 1867, Rabbi Wise was meeting periodically with suffragists and former abolitionists, including Caroline Severance and Lucretia Mott. And this intriguing headline suggests that Rabbi Wise shared the stage in Cincinnati with Reverend Anna Howershaw, a national leader of the woman suffrage movement. Toledo's Pauline Perlmutter Steinem led the Ohio Woman Suffrage Association from 1908 to 1911. When elected to the school board in 1904, Steinem may have become the very first Jewish woman elected to any public office in the United States. And of course, we know that her daughter, her granddaughter, excuse me, Gloria, continued the fight for women's rights. Clout. Uh, if you're from around here, you probably know already that more U.S. presidents have come from Ohio than any other state except Virginia. What you may not have realized is that between 1860 and 1920, more than half of U.S. presidents were from Ohio. Now, most of them opposed woman suffrage, but a few gave glimmers of hope. Now, these powerful men also married strong-minded women, several of whom favored woman suffrage. Why then did these presidents refuse to extend the ballot to women? Carrie Chapman Catt believed that the United States was preceded by 26 other countries in granting equal voting rights to women because of politics. It was the control of public sentiment, the deflecting and the thwarting of public sentiment through the trading and the trickery, the buying and the selling of American politics. Now from books written by members of that last fighting generation, it, it seemed to me that the single greatest impediment to the 19th Amendment was the fearsome power of the black female vote. Let me explain. It's particularly important to consider the impact of the Civil War if we are to understand why victory took so long. In 1861, the suffragists set aside their demands to support the war effort. After the Civil War ended, suffragists came together in a new organization, the American Equal Rights Association, and they proposed that the best way forward was to enfranchise persons of color and women. But the women's rights activists were betrayed by the male abolitionists who had formerly been their closest allies. Wendell Phillips declared that this was the Negro's hour and denied that there had ever been any connection between women's rights and abolitions, sparking a civil war in the woman's suffrage movement that lasted for decades. In May of 1869, the American Equal Rights Association split as factions decided whether to continue the fight for woman suffrage or to support ratification of the 15th Amendment, granting suffrage to freed men alone. Two national suffrage organizations emerged, the National Woman Suffrage Association, uh, led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and which notoriously accepted funding from white supremacist George Francis Train. Uh, later that same year, uh, Lucy Stone and her colleagues met with others in Cleveland, Ohio, to found the American Woman Suffrage Association. Now, ultimately, three Reconstruction Amendments were added to the Constitution. Constitution. Ulysses S. Grant took office in 1869 in the first election after the Civil War, winning at a time when citizens of Texas, Mississippi, and Virginia could not vote in the election. Now, after the 15th Amendment was ratified in February 1870, Grant established the Justice Department and sent federal troops to the South to protect the rights of freedmen and women from the Ku Klux Klan. Suffragists also paid close attention to the new constitutional amendments and how they would be interpreted and enforced. Ohio-born Victoria Woodhull, spiritualist, suffragist, and first female stockbroker on Wall Street, carefully studied the 14th and 15th amendments and argued that they legally entitled all women the right to vote. A year and a half later, in May 1872, Victoria Woodhull became the first woman to run for president of the United States. Now, in the end, Grant easily won a second term, but Woodhull's candidacy and the attempts of suffragists like Susan B. Anthony to vote in the election emphasized the importance of the Reconstruction Amendments to determining who could vote. 
The next election was characterized by ballot stuffing and widespread violence across the South. Ohio's Rutherford B. Hayes actually lost the popular vote, but he won the Electoral College by one vote. Now, Southerners agreed to accept Hayes as president only if he removed federal troops from the South. Afterward, from 1890 to 1908, Southern state legislators made voting more difficult, disenfranchising most of their black citizens and also poor whites in the South. Southerner Woodrow Wilson reinstituted segregation in the U.S. Capitol. More than half a century at the end of the, after the end of the Civil War, race remained a crucial issue. In this article from June 1919, the governor of Louisiana declares, our southern states have been unanimously opposed to the 15th Amendment, and if we now ratify the 19th Amendment, we will be stopped from opposing Negro political, social, and other equalities. Suffragist Maud Wood Park had this to say about what she heard from members of Congress on Capitol Hill. As a man had said in an unguarded moment, the real reason we Southerners don't want woman suffrage is we can club the men away from the polls if we have to, but we couldn't do that with the women. So for Southerners, the 19th Amendment was just too close to the 15th. And in case you don't have that ready, readily memorized, here are the words of the 15th Amendment. And there's the 19th Amendment. When the United States entered World War I, suffragists were again expected to set aside their demands. The National Woman's Party refused. And here we see Alice Paul carrying a banner, quoting, quoting President Wilson's words about entering World War I. The time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there is but one choice, and we have made it. Because of the courage and persistence of suffragists like these, Congress passed the 19th Amendment on June 14, 1919. Ratification was the next battle. Ratification of a constitutional amendment is a numbers game. Two thirds of the members of Congress of both houses have to approve the proposed amendment before it can be sent to the states. And then three fourths of the states must then agree they must ratify if the amendment is to be adopted into law. That moment after the Civil War, when abolitionists abandoned woman suffrage to secure the 15th Amendment, a move that preserved patriarchy despite race at the cost of all women, at the expense of all women, that moment has been painted as the moment when suffragists turned their backs on their African-American sisters by proposing a second constitutional amendment to enfranchise women. The truth is their hand was forced. If suffragists held fast to their roots in abolition, the fight was done before it had begun. Although 11 states had joined the Union since 1870, all it would take to defeat the 19th Amendment was for the 13 former Confederate states to vote as a bloc. In 1920, 36 of 48 states had to ratify the 19th Amendment to make it law. Now, ratification initially proceeded fairly quickly, but victory, as I'm sure you can imagine, was by no means certain. By March 1920, only one more state was needed. States that had ratified the 19th Amendment are shown in the map in white, and I'm sure there's no surprise to you, given what I've shared with you, that uh, the, uh, those uh, in black are places where the amendment had been considered and defeated, uh, eight of the states in that category, and of the five states left, none had a, had a regular session of the legislature scheduled in 1920. Now, ultimately, two additional states called special sessions, North Carolina, which defeated the 19th Amendment, and Tennessee. Now, this is where our story gets pretty interesting. 1920 was a presidential election year, and both candidates were Ohioans, uh, James M. Cox and Warren G. Harding. And the candidates, as leaders of their political parties, could use their clout to influence the outcome. In 1913, Harriet uh, Taylor Upton, a national leader in the suffrage movement from Ohio, she argued that Ohio must lead the fight for women's rights, excuse me, for equal rights. And in 1920, Alice Paul agreed the real battleground for ratification was in, not in Tennessee, but in Ohio. So uh, 
the suffragists met with the candidates. Uh, Senator Harding uh, listened, uh, but evaded. James M. Cox, on the other hand, assured the suffragists of his support, and the result made history. In August 1920, the Tennessee legislature ratified the 19th Amendment with a one-vote margin, and many actually gave Cox uh, credit for the victory. So to win the vote, the suffragists had to be fearless. These women are among the hundreds who in 1917 were arrested, beaten while in custody, and sentenced to prison for standing on a sidewalk in silence, holding a sign. Doris Stevens was educated at Oberlin and recruited to the National Women's Party Executive Committee from Dayton, Ohio. Black suffragists needed even greater courage, just as it had after the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Uh, membership in the Ku Klux Klan skyrocketed when women gained the vote. And by 1924, Ohio was among several northern states with greater membership in the Klan than any single state south of the Mason-Dixon line. So the story, I'm sure you can see, the story of the fight for women's suffrage in Ohio is a story of political clout, persistence, and courage. Ohio became a place where a woman could speak boldly, like Mott, Truth, Stone, and Anthony. It was a place where women could sing loudly, like the Cincinnati girl, Trixie Forganza, inspiration for the feminist tune, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And they could fly high, like suffragist aviator Leader Richburg Hornsby, uh, trained by the rights in Dayton. Now, among these bold women were many members of Ohio's women's clubs. Now, while many women's clubs demonstrated interest in women's suffrage, few publicly endorsed the divisive cause, fearing it would sow discord among their members. Even so, the very first women's club had a, had clubs in the U.S. had a close relationship to women's suffrage and indeed a close relationship to Ohio. Earlier, I mentioned Caroline Severance of Cleveland, a lifelong suffragist and a member, a founding member of the New England Women's Club, one of the very first two clubs, women's clubs in the United States. What you can see here is that the same building that housed the New England Women's Club was also home what, to what became the most influential suffrage publication, the Women's Journal, as well as the American Women's Suffrage Association. And in fact, that clip is taken from the Women's Journal. Now, Alice and Phoebe Carey, who were born and raised in Mount Healthy, right here in Cincinnati, left Ohio for New York in the early 1850s, where publisher Horace Greeley set them to work, to work resolutely earn a living by the pen. By the mid-1850s, the sisters were hosting a salon for intellectuals and reformers, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Both sisters advocated women's suffrage, but were generally silent about it uh, in their writings. Now, in 1868, Alice joined with others to found what was the actual first woman's club in the United States, Cirrhosis, and she became its president. Alice asserted, we have proposed to teach women to think for themselves and get their opinions at first hand, not so much, as because, not so much because it is their right, but because it is their duty. And uh, for a short time, her sister Phoebe actually worked as an assistant editor on Susan B. Anthony's radical newspaper, The Revolution. Typically excluded from white women's clubs, women of color founded, uh, founded their own. Hallie Quinn Brown, a graduate of and later professor at Wilberforce University near Xenia, Ohio, was a founder of the Colored Women's League, which later became the uh, National Association of Col Colored women. And Mary Church Terrell, whom I introduced you to earlier, was the National Association's first president. Now this, getting closer to home, this is Annie Laws, a founder of the Cincinnati Women's Club. I know you're not the same organization, but I understand she uh, also was a member of Women's City Club. In 1897, Laws was nominated by Cincinnati's 14th Ward for the local school board for which women could run and vote uh, prior to 1920. And in 1911, Edith Campbell, a name familiar to you, I think, she became the first woman elected to public office in Cincinnati 
and the very first woman in the United States to receive the vote of a sitting president. And the article you see here was uh, published in the New York Times. Another future Woman City Club member, Cornelia Cassidy Davis, created the, o the iconic Let Ohio Women Vote poster for the 1912 suffrage campaign when National Woman's Party activists blanketed the city. And so it appears that although the Woman's City Club would, from its founding, as you can see from this headline, bar politics, it clearly welcomed political activism. Here is Edith Campbell registering to vote. And when the Board of Elections recorded the largest number of voters in Cincinnati history in 1915, the Woman City Club was credited with increasing the number of female voters. By 1919, I love this, the national anti-suffrage publication, The Woman Patriot, observed that the Woman City Club in Cincinnati was controlled by radical suffragists. So how should we mark the centennial today? Well, I want you to join me and generations of suffragists by adding your name to the history of woman suffrage. There's one really good way to do, to honor their memory to get informed, get involved, and vote. Thank you. And let's also thank the five million women who use their voices to give us ours. So should I, I guess I'll stop the share here. Okay, that's fine. Um, we've not gotten any questions in the chat, I was surprised. So if anybody wants to ask questions in the chat, they can, or if you know how to raise your hand, or if you want to just uh, wave your arms wildly, I'll unmute you. <laughs> we do want questions if you have any. I don't have a question, but I have a comment <laughs> about the vote, in, the vote in Tennessee. Okay. Um, it, it was um, uh, it actually it originally wasn't in favor of it, but it was the youngest uh, person ever elected to the Tennessee state legislature. And he originally was not for it. And then he changed his vote and voted for it. And they accused him of being bribed. And he said, no, not at all. He said, I got a letter from my mother and she told me to help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification, so I did. So there's actually a Cincinnati connection to that final vote for Tennessee that I didn't mention here, but it's uh, the, the story is in one of the suffrage um, uh, Genius of Liberty uh, 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 programs. There actually was a lawsuit that uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but if it hadn't been for a Cincinnati lawsuit that ended up going to the U.S. Supreme Court, filed by George S. Hawk, Tennessee never would, the governor of Tennessee never would have called that special session. So if you're curious about that, um, uh, saving suffrage for the nation is one of the uh, Genius of Liberty six-minute suffrage stories you can check out. So if it weren't for Ohio, we might not have Tennessee, the final state to ratify. Why were so many women forgotten in this history, I see? Um, you know, something, there, something that is astonishing to me is that even in 1930, when, so you know there's a plaque in the Hamilton County Courthouse that honors uh, pioneer suffragists. What I can tell you is that those suffragists uh, weren't, did, they didn't even remember earlier generations of Cincinnati suffragists. Um, Lucy Stone typically refers to the Grimke sisters as the first public speakers, and in fact, it was Frances Wright of a generation before. Um, power of the pen. Uh, it's also why it's much harder to trace uh, the activism of, 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 of women of color, and it's because their words aren't captured, they aren't in the newspaper, they aren't in so many of the sources that we have uh, access to. Um, and you don't see suffrage rising. T suffrage took you know, 72 plus years, um, over a century if you count the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And, um, and, and, and it never shows up, you know, it doesn't show up in histories of the presidents, you know, so. It, it's a footnote in history. So, anyway. Yeah, um, I, I believe you had a question. question. Um, yeah, I do. 
Uh, I want to thank our speaker. Excellent information. Um, but my question is, what got you interested in this particular subject? I love that you have done this. So I left Miami University and I knew I would be bored if I didn't do something. And this was around, I think I left in 2014. And I do needlework. I knit and I crochet and I have always done historical research and I had and I taught technical writing so I thought well maybe I'll look at history of needlework instructions right and I'll do some with that and one day I just realized that the time frame during which the conventions so the, the ideas about how we write instructions for knitting and crocheting overlapped with the time frame for women's suffrage and I did what any normal human being do these days I googled suffrage and crochet and I got some really fascinating information which obviously I've left out of this program because there's not room um, about connections between needle arts and the woman's suffrage movement so I started a project called suffrage and stitches and I just I, I never really intended to become an authority and I never intended to be on a stage like this metaphorically speaking tonight wow. mm -hmm. um, but I just felt so strongly when I read the words of these women, and I've had to cut some things in order to, you know, make for a nice, tight, tidy little program this evening. Mm -hmm. um, I was so inspired and, and so, uh, their words are so relevant today. So much of what we're experiencing today echoes what, what, what they went through. And I just uh, thought it was so frustrating. I thought they deserved to be heard. And so that's what I try to do in The Genius of Liberty, which has stories I can't fit in here. That's what I tried to do with Suffrage and Stitches, and that's what I just kept trying to do. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Catherine? Yes. Not, not being a native of Ohio, um, your presentation was fascinating to me. Does Oberlin do anything to recognize their history in women's suffrage? Oh, I expect they do. And I'll mention I am a transplant as well. I grew up in New Mexico. So okay. um, I moved to Ohio in 20, uh, 2000. So um, 20 years here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. Um, there, uh, so much of this is grassroots, which mm -hmm. is frustrating to me that you know, the bicentennial, there was federal funding, there was, you know, there were coordinated programs across the United States um, for the women's centennial. There's, it's primarily driven by grassroots and individuals like me who just think somebody ought to say something. Um, so, so I don't, I, so it's difficult to tell what's happening yeah. in places. There is a calendar, a national calendar, the Women's Vote Centennial Initiative has online. Um, but of course, with the pandemic, everything has gotten shuffled. There is talk about uh, focusing on the suffrage centennial, delaying uh, celebrations to 2021, so. There oh, I, that's, Rachel Carmen, I see uh, the, the enfranchising Native Americans in 1962 uh, in New Mexico. Yeah, the Spanish vote was very interesting as well. So let me see. Oh, somebody's doing needlepoint, Kathy Merchant. Oh, awesome. I would love to show you the shawl that I made with them. Um, one yarn is called Votes for Women Every Year, Everywhere. That's what the color is called. And the other one is called Equal Justice Under Law. So. Um, that's what I'm working on finishing up. Didn't get it done for today. Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, Equal Rights Amendment, uh, written by Alice Paul in 1920 and, and, and uh, uh, launched in 1923, three years after, um, three years after the, um, of women get the right to vote. Um, there's a great, um, Equal Justice Under Law is a, another um, story in the uh, Genius of Liberty series that has to do with, at the same time, they are losing their home in Washington, D.C. to eminent domain, uh, I think, because the gentleman did not want to uh, be seen. So let me see. Oh, of the buttons I'm wearing. Um, uh, so this one, let me see. This one is a replica. It's very, very similar 
to an old pin. Um, and then this one, these two, one I can't really take them off. There's a ribbon and then there's, that says 2020 and it's purple. And then this one is for the California Women's uh, Suffrage Association, Women's Rights Activism. And um, I wore it mostly because it's beautiful and it coordinates with my top. And of course, we have a Cincinnati suffragist who uh, many, several Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati suffragists got involved in the California movement after she left Ohio in 1885. Um, the National Women's History Alliance uh, or project, I don't remember if it's one of them or both of them together, uh, has a catalog of suffrage related swag. I have hats, I have, you can get sashes, I have all kinds of stuff Ooh. here. Um, and I'd be happy to share uh, the catalog link with uh, Women's City Club uh, after the program and then um, you can, you can get some of that awesome swag and support uh, the preservation of women's history. So. This is a perfect segue into the National Women's History Museum. This is the anniversary scarf for the women's suffrage movement. And thank you so much, Catherine. Are you associated or in tune with them? They would love to have your, your program on your, uh, their gathering information all the time. And I think it would be an excellent place for you to have this program. Well, thanks. Um, I know people, so I've interacted with people who, so I have a friend who knows somebody who's, uh, I believe, associated with the National Women's History Museum. And then I know a couple of people who are involved with the National Women's History Project and Alliance. And I'm not sure how those three connect. Um, they haven't asked. Uh, I haven't volunteered because I'm actually kind they're of a shy person. Asking for stories, both personal and things that you've put together. They're currently negotiating to buy Union Station in Washington, D.C. They tried very hard uh -huh. to get the last building space on the Washington Mall, but they're working hard on, on getting Union Station. And they want personal stories, stories of relatives who are active in, this, in the social movement. And uh, I would encourage all, for, all everybody to get in touch with the National Women's History Museum. Be great. Yeah. Well, it looks like we need to move on. Uh, one, I guess one thing I want to jump in because there were several questions related to it about race. Um, and I thought maybe if you could make a comment about some of those questions, uh, then we could wrap up the Q&A. Catherine, I, I had asked one of the questions, and there seems to be a, a long history of stresses and strains between black and women in their fr a fight to, for equality. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's, you have any ideas of how we can overcome that? Oh, gosh. Well, I guess the first thing I would, the first thing, one of the things I tried to point out in my program is that um, initially there was a strong allyship, and it was with the if I've learned anything, I've learned how politicians are expert in dividing constituencies. And that's sort of <laughs> why I talk about, you know, divide and conquer. Um, and so maybe the, the most important thing is some of the advice that I've seen online, which is to uh, lift up uh, women of color, to listen to women of color, and to give them the floor and to, and to I'm not going to choose the right word, but to share their voices, to, you know, so, um, you know, uh, and I do that in some of the Genius of Liberty um, episodes, so I do what I can, uh, and I think that, you know, listening to other people and accepting them and, and owning responsibility for, for our own uh, contributions, even unwitting, to hierarchies and inequalities is important. Okay, um, well, there was a question uh, that came up about must read books and I thought if you could maybe throw some in the chat, that would be great. Um, well, um, I guess we'll I'll send do you a list. Uh, I'll send you a list, okay? okay. That would be better. Okay. That would be wonderful, and we'll send it to everybody who uh, signed up for this program. So, um, and then um, should we go ahead and do the musical thing, even though it's not news, or or should we move on? It's 
Um, it's almost 7.30, oh, okay. so I, Let's move. I, I think we should probably move on. Um, okay. We don't want to be here all night. <laughs> right, I, I'm, good with, I'm good with that, and we will, we will send the Muse recording if it gets sent to us, and we'll also send the link to what I would have played had we decided we had the time. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Sure. Um, okay, a little bit more about uh, Catherine Terser, our next uh, speaker, and thank you, Catherine Durek. Um, so much. Catherine Terser, um, once again, Executive Director of Common Cause Ohio, um, an expert on redistricting reform and state level campaign finance. Catherine advocates for greater transparency and more accountable government and helped lead <clears throat> Ohio's successful efforts to address gerrymandering. Before joining Common Cause, uh, Ohio in April 2012, she was Ohio Citizen Action's legislative director. During her tenure at Ohio Citizen Action, she served as the director for their Money in Politics project and co-authored a number of studies tracking campaign contributions. In 2006, she received the Spirit of Democracy Award from the Ohio Secretary of State. She, these days, she is a very busy woman, so we are very lucky to have her tonight. Welcome, Catherine. Well, thank you so much. It's like the, the two Catherines today, isn't it? <laughs> this presentation is really about voting now. Um, and the thing that I would say about that is, you know, before we move on, um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is, is this from uh, 1914, and this is at our Ohio State House. And you'll see all the different counties. And you know, when you think about the story of voting, it is about power, and it's about demanding to have a voice and a man demanding to to make our voices and our votes meaningful. Um, and so, yes, a hundred years ago, um, we made great strides, um, and it has taken you know a hundred years to get to the, to the civil rights era. And we continue to have some very real struggles. And you know that really has to do with we're talking about sharing power, and we're talking about demanding power. Um, and so we've moved you know from 19, 1920 all the way up to 2004. I thought, you know we need to take a moment to think about the problems that are in place and that are really clear. So for example, in 2004, we had these incredibly long lines and um, the machines were placed in wrong locations so that certainly um, African-Americans um, had much longer lines. Students had significantly more longer lines. And it was very clear that we needed to make some changes. However, when I got to 2005, the state legislature didn't actually move. And I don't know if you all remember Reform Ohio Now. Um, that was a citizen initiative where signatures were collected to do a, a package of reforms. And one of the reforms that was the most popular was creating um, early vote, 30 days of early vote, um, where people could go in person and vote early. And also, we, you know, also the other reform that was super popular was voting by mail, creating a system where you no longer had to say, oh, I'm going to be out of the county, or I'm too ill, I need to vote by mail, that it would create a no-fault absentee ballot. And so what was very clear to the legislators is they did not want redistricting reform, and they weren't really happy with the package that had to do with money and politics. So what they did is they passed very quickly in August of 2005, just about right now, they passed the early vote and the no fault absentee voting. So we have some really good rules when it comes to voting because of citizen action, because people started to collect signatures. And I know that th there are those among us today that actually collected signatures during that time period. I certainly did. Um, I worked mostly on communications then, but you know, it's important to realize that, that we have had some, what we might think of as failed efforts that actually moved the ball down the field. And so when we listen to the previous, um, you know, the previous presentation, and you started to think about how things would move forward and they would move backwards and they would move sideways, 
it's important to think about how um, even today there are reform efforts that are not making progress right now, um, but they are setting the stage for much better access to the polls later. So because of those people who are collecting signatures and knocking on doors, um, we have early in-person vote. We can vote by mail and we can vote on election day. And we are one of those states that have robust options and we should be really proud. Now, we have some other people who just a few years ago also collected signatures. And you might say to yourself, well, what does this have to do with voting? Well, voting is not just access to the polls, right? It's having a meaningful vote. It means that if gerrymandering, if the manipulation of district lines are manipulating our votes and manipulating who gets into office and then manipulating the public policy, well, we all need to get together and we need to do an incredible effort and an incredible push. And so that means that we had a couple of failed efforts. You know, if you think about this, the League of Women Voters, their first redistricting reform effort that failed was in 1981. And then remember, we failed in 2005. And we got our butts kicked in 2012. But it laid, you know, it laid the stage, it set everything so that we were able to pass state legislative redistricting reform because we were able to put pressure on the state legislature so that they put it on the ballot in December of 2014 as voters passed it in 2015. And then when they could not seem to get their act together to address congressional redistricting reform, we collected signatures again and we got their attention. And so the legislature came to the table. And so I wanna remind you all that two 2021 is when we're going to be doing the map making and we need to be prepared and vigilant and I hope some of you will become part of the army of citizen map makers because when we think about the vote we need to think about how it is that we can be active not just on election day but all year long and we can be vigilant all the time so that we in fact in 2022 will actually have district lines that we deserve and the ability to vote for the folks that we want. Now, I wanted to take a moment for us to think about some of the challenges that we do have this year. Um, 35,000 poll workers are needed. Many of us have been poll workers, but we're a little anxious about actually doing that. Um, the average age of poll workers across Ohio is 64, that's the average. Um, and we know that many of the poll workers just need to stay home and make sure that they're safe. One of the things that they, um, uh, that uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, I'm su super sorry, uh, we have a wonderful physician who's part of our Ho Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, and he always highlights the Kaiser Foundation, there we go, and using the Kaiser Foundation's information, he extrapolated and said 40% of us are vulnerable to the more significant impacts. This is 40% of voters, 40% of Ohio voters. And so we really need to be thinking about voting by mail. We need to be thinking about safe in-person voting. We also need to be super aware that we're in a time period where people are under incredible economic pressure. And we will be seeing a rise in evictions, which can get in the way of people actually casting a ballot because you need to be registered at a location. And if you've moved, there are all sorts of questions. Can I still vote? What's a provisional ballot? How will this work? So, you know, there, you know, as many of us who are voting experts and voting advocates, we're going to be needing to think about, well, how do we educate people and make sure that the folks who are really struggling feel like they've really truly been invited into the process. Now, I don't actually have to tell you um, that the U.S. Postal Service is under attack. And that, in fact, um, when they took a bunch of ways of sorting things and a variety of different ways to make sure that the mail gets where it needs to go. For example, people power, right? Um, if you cut back and say, hey, we can't do overtime, you, you can't, you, you actually have to leave. The mail can, um, you know, you can just end up having all this mail that doesn't get where it needs to go. And there's some real consequences for that. 
But the things that are worrisome about that, of course, has to do with us more relying on voting by mail because it's the safest to vote from our kitchen table. Um, we know that people will need to make some choices. They will need, you know, when we talk about flattening the curve when it comes to COVID, we need to be thinking about getting your application in as soon as possible. Now, we know that there are, in fact, many Ohioans who've already done that. Um, all across all across the state, um, I'm in Franklin County, and 40,000 um, applications have already been submitted in Franklin County. Um, and it's similar all over the state where people are saying, okay, I understand that these Board of Elections are operating under circumstances where they're having to change the way they normally do elections. They had a longer than usual primary time where they had to switch gears and really change things. So they had to spend money they didn't anticipate spending. So we need to do our part. And our part is not procrastinating and making sure that we don't wait until the last minute now, you know, there are options like taking your ballot to the Board of Elections. Um, but the Secretary of State, for example, has said that there's only one place where you can drop your ballot off. That is at the Board of Elections. Now, we do know that there's a lawsuit about this. Um, but when we think about the kind of pressure we're in, it's incredibly hard to even imagine why the Secretary of State would make a decision to say there's only one place that you can actually take your ballot. Um, there's some evidence that, and it, this makes sense to people, um, that in fact, you know, we end up uh, only being willing to travel, you know, five miles is what they kind of average um, that some research suggests. I have a volunteer who spent some time looking at the primary and the general from last year to see how far people usually are willing to travel to um, go to early vote, or if you think of it as drop their ballot off. And it's generally about five miles. And so we should be following that court case pretty closely because the voting, um, the, the, the drop box is, uh, you know, that argument over whether we should have drop boxes and more drop boxes, that could make a tremendous difference in the ability for people to easily vote. Now, um, I would encourage you all, you know, if you go to voteohio.gov, you can um, get county information, but you also have the ability to track your ballot. And I would encourage all of us, if we choose to vote by mail, to track your ballot. And so it really, this year is all about being a really engaged voter and doing what we can to really encourage people that we know to you know, don't procrastinate. If you're going to vote by mail, do it right away. If you decide that you want to vote in person, I would encourage you all to vote early in person, but try to pick off hours. And that means further away from the election. So once again, not waiting until that weekend before uh, election day, when in fact, there often are lines uh, at the boards of elections to think about, hey, let's get that in. Uh, let's get, get myself over to that board of elections and do it um, we cannot talk about 2020 without thinking of the amount of disinformation that is out there. We are, we are so fortunate. We live in this era where there's so much information where, where you, you know, you can put into Google crochet and suffrage and you can actually get information. Like, you know, it's kind of miracle, isn't it? And yet, unfortunately, we live in an era where videos can more easily be ma manipulated. So they call them deep, deep fake uh, videos. We do know that there are some certain perks for some candidates if people just don't vote. That there are, there are strategies that are done by candidates um, to actually discourage voting and to encourage other people to vote. And so this includes, you know, phony messages, um, disinformation, and we can't forget that um, much like, you know, the Russians were providing misinformation on Twitter and um, suggesting that Hillary Clinton was nasty and all of the kinds of, kinds of things that were out there, we will be experiencing those things again. 
And we just, we really need to arm ourselves so that we're prepared to be in an era of information, disinformation, and misinformation. And so, you know, when we see, you know, th this can be really difficult. When somebody says, oh, don't share misinformation. Well, you have to figure out if it's misinformation in the first place, right? So one is to be really clear, it's not satire. So that, uh, that can often happen. The thing is, we live in an era where all sorts of things happen and you're like, okay, is it the onion? And, and a good example of that would be when um, the Republican Party made a decision not to have a platform. I thought, I thought that it was the onion. And so I was like, this can't possibly be right. And so I looked to see, okay, does the Washington Post have it? Does the New York Times have it? What is the Columbus Dispatch saying? Um, what's, what is public radio saying? To, to make sure that it actually was accurate. And so if you see something, and, and the opposite of this, the, uh, you know, another, another one that would be a good example of this is um, there was a meme going around that the Democrats had removed, um, you know, under God from the Pledge of Allegiance for the folks at the Democratic Convention. Now, it just wasn't true, um, but it was going around. And so it's a matter of going and looking and trying to figure out well, which news services are presenting it, you know, and taking some time before you share anything. And that notion of like, especially if you have a gut reaction or an emotional reaction to it, take a moment to be like, okay, is this actually right? Is this true? How many different sources are actually reporting it before you start sharing it? And, you know, I know we are all smart people, um, but it can be really hard right now to know what's true when so much seems peculiar. Um, I, you know, the other thing that I think is important is that whole notion of taking a moment to be like, well, am I benefiting anybody by sharing this story? One of the things that can happen is that um, when we talk, about voter fraud, even if we're pushing back and we say, you know what, voter fraud does not actually happen that often, that in fact, this whole ballot harvesting thing, that is not the way that Ohio operates. One of the things that we can do is amplify the word fraud and voter fraud and people's anxieties, when in fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to communicate that we should have confidence in the election. Our, you know, our voting system in Ohio works and we want to encourage people to vote. And so making sure that we think about, are we amplifying confusion and um, apprehension about voting? Um, and I'd encourage us all just to, you know, just to be really thoughtful and take time before we share things on social media. Um, okay, so I was just talking about the hacking of our minds, right? that there's all of these people who are trying to influence us and get us to share things that aren't quite accurate. And because we are so siloed on social media, we may not get a complete, you know, we may not get a complete story unless we actually take time to move beyond what we're seeing and our friends are seeing and look a little bit deeper. Now, I'm, um, one of the concerns we should have during 2020 has to do with actual hacking. Um, we do know that um, the Russians, for example, were attempting to hack into voter databases during 2016. Um, there was some level of success. One of the things that's really scary is um, success in, sec they measure it in like seconds, like, like how many seconds it took before they were able to repudiate it. And I think the thing that we need to be super aware of is that the Secretary of State has been working to establish the kinds of protocols that will make sure that our um, infrastructure that's related to elections that's online, so the online voter registration system, are the databases that are shared because of course there's a sharing back and forth between the Secretary of State and Hamilton County, for example, that we are, you know, that they are doing what they can to make sure that there's a buffer um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, the Secretary of State has that is very interesting to follow is the Ready for November Task Force, um, which is available on the Ohio Channel. Um, and they're working very closely with Homeland Security 
to, and, and to address some of the kinds of attacks that might be out there. And one of the things that uh, Frank LaRose talked about last week, which I thought was very interesting, is he was encouraging hackers. Now, he was encouraging white, white hat hackers. He was saying, you know what? We want to crowdsource the problem. And we're going to encourage folks to try to get into our voter registration database. We're going to encourage them to try to take over county websites. As long as they report it to us, we will then try to fix the problem. And I really, I love this. Um, Matt Olney, um, who is a, a security expert said, um, nobody wants to know their baby is ugly. Um, and this whole project is about po pointing out that even though the Secretary of State has been doing all these things and they've moved to .gov websites for all of the different county websites, um, and they've made a bunch of different um, changes that in fact, you know, there's going to be a hole or more than one. And so putting this out, crowdsourcing it, um, what will happen is, you know, these encourage people to um, actually poke at the system. And then um, the Secretary of State will do what they can to attempt to fix it. And then they'll reveal to the public within a couple weeks what actually happened. So we should all be looking to see you know, what actually happens with this process. And I kind of love the crowdsourcing. Um, so if any of you are doing some hacking as well as a little bit of embroidery, this would be worth a worthy project. <laughs> now I mentioned the voteohio.gov. Um, one of the things that is really important when it comes to election information is looking to um, reputable, reputable sources. And so, you know, we know the League of Women Voters and they have, you know, the, the vote 411. We know this is good information. Um, we know that if you see a .gov, it comes from the government. And so if in doubt, voteohio.gov is the Secretary of State's website with good information. And then I also wanted to draw your attention to the election protection. So um, in the 60s, um, John Kennedy created the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And they're exactly what you would imagine at this point. They're a nonprofit lawyers committee for civil rights under law, a bunch of lawyers who spend their time preparing for elections. They do election lawsuits, um, but they also have the nonpartisan election protection hotline, which runs, you know, 60, 365 days a year. And certainly at this point, it, you know, people are calling in. And this is a place, if you see misinformation, this is what you should do. It's six our vote, 866 our vote. This is a place that if you see something that you think, okay, this does not seem right, or you get a text that you're like, what is this? I would encourage you to touch base with them. Um, and, and in fact, during early vote for Ohioans, um, Common Cause and our friends at the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, including the League of Women Voters, all Voting is Local, Ohio Voice, and a variety of other folks, we actually answer the election protection hotline. We don't do it on election day when we're, you know, out checking to see how things are going at polling locations, uh, but during early vote, we will be answering your phone calls. And, and with that, I just want to encourage, much the way Catherine ended her presentation, I want to encourage you all to get out there and vote. And so, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I, I realize uh, at this point, you all have been here a while, so I think this might be a good time for questions. Okay, there were, there were several questions about mechanical things about voting, uh, some of which you might have answered. Uh, but uh, one question that came up that I fear there's not a good answer for is um, how to confirm that your vote by mail application has been received and processed. So yes, so you can actually track your ballot voteohio.gov. There's an area called track your ballot. What it'll do is it goes from there to your county board of elections and you can actually see did they receive my application? Is it, you know, is it on the way? And you can, you have a sense, oh, all right, it's being processed. Like you can actually follow it the whole way along. And so for those of us have been like, okay, things are not going so smoothly with the U.S. Postal Service. Maybe <laughs> 
I would highly encourage you to, if you're very worried, to drop your ballot off at the Board of Elections, but also to feel that there is enough time, there's adequate time between the time the, the, the ballots will go out, which is the very beginning, the very beginning of early vote, to get that in. Um, and you can track it the whole way along. Any other questions? Can you track it to see that they actually count it as well? That's so a concern. Can. So that's one of the things that is really wonderful. They, they have set it into place so that you can actually go through the whole process. Okay. And it becomes really important. I don't know if you noticed, this would have been two weeks ago, there was a story that public radio um, had, had done um, and they were, it was also with Associated Press, um, which had to do with uh, you know, the number of votes that didn't get counted and it had to do with the signature match or things like people forgot to put the signature on the outside of the envelope. And so there are things that can go wrong. Um, and one of the things that, um, that uh, we can do is actually correct things if we get them in early. So once again, do not procrastinate people. If you get it, and when you get it in, um, also if you're taking it to the Board of Elections, you can just drop it off in the drop box there, or you could actually hand it to a Board of Election official who could uh, look at the outside and say, okay, your signature is not here, um, and really look it over. So I noticed there was a, a question that had to do with who could drop ballots off. We're talking about, um, so I can drop it off for my husband and all of us can, you know, you can drop it off for your spouse. Um, when they talk about family members, they're talking about your kids. They're not talking about your cousins. Unfortunately, they're not talking about your grandchildren. So as we think about it really truly is immediate family and I know they put this in place so that they, because they really wanted to be sure that, that um, things were safe and there wasn't um, any kind of shenanigans that can go on. And we do know that, not that it happens a lot, but the ballot harvesting is a thing. Um, and so that's why it's in place, but it is important to realize that, this, that you cannot give your ballot to your grandchildren. Um, they could get in trouble. Catherine, I have, I have a grandchild who is voting absentee from mm -hmm. France and he votes out of my house. He has to send it to my, I'm not sure what, what to do about that. Can I, can I not drop it off? So, so the way that, the way that that will, you know, the, what they'll do is they will work with him. His ballot will go out before the other ones, any of those folks that are overseas. Um, you need to, you know, he needs to request now and the ballot will go, you know, the ballot will go to him and then he will need to get it back. I, I my daughter was in Australia for a while. Um, and, and so, you know, other than the name, you know, you probably don't have to do a darn thing. That's going to be up to him, but he can track his ballot. Um, it is the kind of thing where as soon as he gets the ballot, he wants to take care of that as soon as possible. It's funny that we'll they, get the whole story of this election is don't procrastinate. Right. But if he's registered at your house, that's going to be a problem. I was registering oh, voters no, to well, all he has to do is all he, all he has to do is actually apply to vote by mail. If he did it today, apply to vote by mail. It doesn't the where he's registered. There, basically, if you have on the form, you have, hey, this is where I'm registered in Cincinnati, Ohio. The next line is, where do I want my ballot to go? And so what he'll do is he'll put, this is where my ballot goes. And then you put, you know, he'll put it into the mail and they'll send a ballot off to him. I did register at, at a food pantry today and three of the people who thought they were registered and we were simply checking that they were registered and they were not. One had been a change of address, but the other two thought that they had been registered. They had not. One said they voted in the last election, but they were not on the polls because over 200,000 people had been knocked off the polls. So you should check that you are registered. And uh, I was using voteohio.org, and there's a thing that says check my registration, and it comes right back up and tells you the result almost immediately. Very uh, nice. I have a question. Uh, I'm concerned that so many of the ballots get rejected for technical reasons, not because they're not gone. I mean, there's the 
the problem not getting in on time, but the filling out, and maybe not just the signatures, but other mistakes. What can what can we do to help with that? Is there a way we can educate? How do we educate people so they know what's how to do it correctly? Or is there anything that can be done? So fortun fortunately, um, the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition has a bunch of different things that we can share on social media, the best advice that you can give to people who are applying is to go very slowly and carefully on their applications. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure they put in date of birth rather than today's date. And, 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 and you might say, well, that sounds, well, why would this happen? But this is the major thing that gets those applications. The beginning of the process <coughs> work is people are not putting in their birth dates. And so we are at a time period where we're not getting together in the same kind of way. You know, it would be great to be able to hang out at the library and check people's registrations. And some of you are doing that, but we're just not doing things in the same kind of way. Um, one of the programs that the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition has are called voter information boxes. So you might think to yourself, I would like to do a voter information box. Basically what this is, is it, you know, those realtor boxes that have flyers in them, they, they look, you know, they're like basically a rectangle and you open them up and inside, um, inside they have voter registration forms and they have the vote by mail applications. Um, and, and then there's signs where, where uh, you know, where, where literally you can take your phone as long as you have, a, you know, you have, have one of the smartphones and you can actually take a picture of it and it takes you to voteohio.gov and you can, you can your voter registration. So if you are at all interested in getting a voter information box, um, you know, please let me know. I will send you a note. So you have my email. And then is there anything else that I have missed? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one here from Jane. Uh, she says, you mentioned, Janet, I'm sorry. You mentioned the issue of evictions. Okay, so um, what the reason that I worry about the evictions is that what can happen is people are like, well, I'm not at my red, I'm not, at, I'm not, I'm not anywhere. Like, well, you know, I'm kind of couch surfing. How do I actually handle this? And so one of the things that I would encourage anybody who's doing this is to actually call the board of elections, let them know that this is this is what's going on, um, because we do know that there are certain organizations in Ohio that are looking and saying, okay, this person is actually not registered at this location. Some nonprofits will allow people to actually register at their that that address, you know, at their address. So this is often what people that are homeless actually do. It's a place where they're able to get the mail. It is, it, is a, a, it is a circumstance that makes it just a little bit difficult. The other thing is if somebody has moved, let's say they moved, you know, they moved from Mount Pleasant down to Cincinnati and they've like moved different into from different locations. Um, what you do is if you have not changed your registration, as long as you're in the same county, what you do is you go to your new polling location, which you can look up at voteohio.gov and you go to that locate that new location and they'll give you a provisional ballot to vote so that you can cast a ballot. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure, please. Um, I have several questions. First of all, do you think we're gonna need more than one stamp to make sure it gets back? Second of all, is there actually somebody at the Dropbox checking whether your grandson is taking your ballot or you're taking his? And why can't we have more than one box off, drop box? And how big are they? <laughs> okay. Well, this. The, so I actually had a picture of the drop a uh, drop box. Oh, that was pretty big. That's in right. Montgomery County, it's pretty big. The one that was in Franklin County was more mailbox size. Yeah, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. We know a lot of people are going to be voting by mail. A lot more people are going to be voting, and they will look, be a, a rush in the end. I mean, to drive over to the Norwood area where our drop box is, there's only one drop box per county. 
I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. And is there anyone standing there saying, oh, no. your grandson brought your ballot. Is there anyone checking when people are dropping off? So what does it matter? Okay, so so um, one, uh, this becomes a little bit complicated. Um, the state legislature did not act when they had the opportunity. They did not choose, for example, to um, pay for our a postage, so you wouldn't have to worry how many stamps it actually is. Um, the legislature did not make decisions about saying, hey, um, why don't we create multiple um, drop boxes? Um, Georgia did. Like when you, when you start to think, like, so we're talking about really good common sense things. And it is absolutely true that um, the, the that you could drop things off in those in those drop boxes. They aren't generally monitored by cameras, um, and it just depends on um, you know how diligent the board of elections are. And some you know it, it's you know one of the things that we need, need to be really clear is we need to encourage people to follow the law. Um, even though it's like speeding, it's, it's not a good idea to speed. Some of us do, um, but it is against the law. Right. But what I'm saying is it invites fraud in a way. I mean, there could be people dumping thousands of envelopes so nobody can get theirs in there. I mean, it's really ludicrous that we only have one drop box for the whole of Hamilton County. And I think it's an actually voter suppression. Well, we are going to have to, you know, it, it, this is something that often happens is that we need to wait and see what is the courts actually decide. Um, it's really clear to me that we should have more drop boxes because we're in a really special era and most of us would like to be able to vote by mail, but we want to make sure it gets where it needs to go. Um, and, and so it's very hard to understand why we're in this circumstance. So how would you handle the stamp issue? How do we know how much stamps to put on it? And, and how can we get the word out to other people that maybe just to be safe, you should put two stamps on? If you mail it and there's insufficient postage, would it be returned to the post office, which means you probably wouldn't get it in on time and you'd have to go vote and become provisional? So fortunately, even though this is not well publicized, um, if you do not put adequate postage on, it still gets to the Board of Elections and well, that's the, elections the county will pay for it. Uh, um, one of the things that they will do is they will highlight on the, uh, you know, uh, in the information um, how much postage you should expect. One of the things that has happened is that um, they haven't quite gotten it right, but people should you know, yes, you can actually go in and weigh it and at, at the board of elect the board of, at, at the post office if you're worried about it. But you shouldn't worry if you put it in and there's not adequate postage. That that means that it'll come back to you if it's not adequate. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'd like to ask a question. I put it in the chat and just very quickly. This is an offbeat thing, but it's been coming up amongst a number of Republicans who are saying, "Oh, really? Anybody can get to vote." Namely, that there is a provision if a, an individual can't get in to the board of elections or to drop their ballot um, or to go vote, that they can have for a dollar sixty-five. And a federal, I believe it's a federal employee, come to them and pick up their ballot. They can pay a dollar sixty-five to have it taken. Anybody else ever heard about this? You no. shake. No. Okay. No. This no. is really being promulgated by a number of Republicans I've talked to. It's amazing. I like to find out where this comes from. Is there some obscure provision back where? Anybody so know? Every uh, every state and every location, like, um, how can I put this? Federal um, folks are not involved in election law. It's a, each state does things slightly differently. Um, so one of the things I would do is I would call 866-OUR-VOTE. Um, that's the election protection hotline. Let them know what you're hearing um, and this will help them guide and inform. Um, so it is true that if you were hospitalized, for example, the day before the election, you haven't voted, you're hospitalized, you can, in fact, call the Board of Elections and they will send a Democrat and a Republican to the hospital and you can, they, and they can watch you basically cast your ballot. Hmm. That okay. is true. 
Um, it's the same kind of thing when it comes to in, you know, voting in jail. People who are, um, who are at the very last minute picked up for a DUI, for example, they can request that Board of Elections send out a Democrat and Republican to the jail so that they can actually cast a ballot. Um, but that has to do with you know, your local county boards of elections facilitating voting. So one of the things that could be different this, you know, could be, that will be different this year has to do with um, the whole issue of masks. I don't know if you've noticed, it's a little political, the whole mask thing. <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, Frank LaRose has said, you have to wear a mask if you go inside to vote. And has, has saying that folks who don't want to choose to wear a mask, they're going to have to do curbside voting. So basically, it'll be like driving up to the McDonald's and, you know, curbside, curbside voting. So I, clearly, um, this means more, um, you know, election officials, the board, of, you know, the, the, the workers, the poll workers on election day having to do things that they normally don't, you know, like, yes, we've had curbside voting for a long time for folks that who have disabilities. It isn't actually used that often. Um, and this would be anybody who chose not to wear a mask. So you could imagine the challenges of the November election with dealing with people both inside and outside. I, ju I just want to make a correction. I do not know that this is a federal employee. I don't want to imply something that okay. I, I have not verified. So I, I will check further on it and I will try to get that information out to people too. Um, I just want to say that I've heard that the Hamilton County ballot, at least with all the local races, you will need two stamps. I would not assume that you can get away with it. Use two stamps. So, so they are often very long in presidential election years, especially yeah. odd numbered years. They're often a little bit shorter, but um, yes, I would, I would assume it'll be two stamps. And remember to turn your ballot over and vote all the way down the ticket. Don't forget those judges. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the county races are on the back end too. And for folks that are wondering about um, judicial votes counts is where you can get information about for judge. Um, it's judicial votes count. Um, this is a, pro a project with um, the University of Akron, um, Bliss Institute up there, the League of Women Voters, and also the State Bar Association. Also this year, I think it's going to be the 20th of September. Um, they announced it, but they didn't give a time. So I'm, you know, I, I was a little worried, but we should get more information about this. Um, there is going to be a forum with the Supreme Court candidates. So it's not a debate as such, but more of a forum so we can hear directly from those Supreme Court candidates and learn a little bit more about them. And of course, those races are extremely important. Um, you know, Supreme, the Supreme Court will makes decisions every time there is a, a consumer, consumer legislation passed. If the Consumer Council does not like it, it is the Ohio Supreme Court that is the arbiter. So um, when we think about like House Bill 6 um, and some of those kinds of things, we, the utility things are decided there. The other thing that's important is that the Ohio Supreme Court will determine the constitutionality of the new district lines. So it's also worth understanding who these folks are um, and casting your ballot. I, I would also say, remind people that the, um, ju the judicial races, none of them have a D or an R next to their name. So to whatever party you are, if you want to know who they are, you need to look at some sample ballot to find out who it is that you might think about voting for. Because even though they ran in a Democratic or Republican primary to get on the ballot, there will not be a D or an R next to their names in November. So it's interesting. This is this is the year of reminding you, do not procrastinate. Make sure you check everything really carefully. And you're absolutely right. This is a year of research to, you know, really dive in and get to know these candidates, especially the judicial candidates. We, we keep talking about uh, criminal justice reform, but on any, um, for example, in the Hamilton County uh, Court of Common Pleas, the majority of judges are the ones who get together and end up making the rules that would allow criminal justice reform. 
So who you elect makes a big difference. Also, I don't know if you noticed, I went through this whole discussion of this election and I never talked about money in politics. Yeah. <laughs> because mostly because, well, um, there's only so much time, but I, we also need to realize the role of money and uh, money and power and all of those things. And hopefully you'll have me for another time. Well, I will talk all, all sorts of money and politics, perhaps talk about the householder enterprise if you're interested. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Catherine, with all the nuances of this election, and you can't go into schools, you can't go into churches to talk to people about voting, uh, we, are we using the public uh, television and NPR to get all this information out? So I think one of the challenges you know, has to do with, yes, public radio, public television, they're doing um, the access channels that we have in our communities. They're doing what they can to get information out there. Um, challenge this year simply because we're not, you know, we're not having canvassers knock on our door. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, you know, handing out or checking people's voter registrations at festivals and parades and all of the different you know, pumpkin show or whatever, um, we're not doing that this year. So it is one of the reasons why it is well worth being somebody who shares good voting information on social media. Um, you can get good information from the League of Women Voters that you can share or Common Cause. You can get something from the Secretary of State that you can share. Um, we all need to figure out how it is that we can actually, um, you know, actually get information out to at least to our friends. Um, and then if you're interested in those voter information boxes and putting them in, in, your, uh, in your yard or a church, if a church is nearby that you think is a really good location that people will easily see, just let, let me know. Thank you. Well, Jeff was going to um, wrap this up and tell us about our next programs. Jeff, are you there? I am here. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, I turned my video off. Yeah. Because uh, I was uh, typing and doing weird things, even though I was listening very intently. <laughs> um, I do want to put a few things in the chat. We have uh, some future programs. The next one is on September 16th, and that is a forum on the collaborative agreement then and now with Al Gerhardstein and Iris Rowley of the Black United Front. I'm going to paste all this information into the chat uh, just so that people have it, I think. Uh, that's at least the first part of it. And um, I also want to give a plug for joining the Woman City Club, and I will send a link for that so that you won't have uh, any problem doing that if you'd like to. We encourage members. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to include that as well. Um, I thank to both our presenters and for everyone for coming. This has been a really lively discussion. It was really challenging following the chat because there was so much going on, but a lot of people were answering each other's questions, which was showing just how smart we all are. <laughs> so thanks to everyone. And I'm going to uh, give that link that I promised. Okay. Well, I, 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 I personally want to thank our two fabulous speakers tonight, and um, I think their presentations uh, clearly show that voting cannot be taken for granted. So we, we fought very hard for the right to vote, and we, we need to exercise it. So thank you all for attending. It's been a wonderful evening. We'll see you on September 16th. <laughs>